afternoon, everybody. I am Dr. Satyaki Saikya. I am one of the internal medicine consultants in Apollo Excel Care Hospital. My training is in internal medicine. And uh, today, uh, we are starting a series of lectures. I don't want to actually call it a lecture. It's more of an interactive session uh, that we intend to have with patients and their families uh, about issues that matter to them. Most of the time when we have medical discussions, we have it in the realm of medical science and there's a lot of medical jargon that is used by uh, physicians. So this series of lectures is not about one specific uh, disease or illness, but it is more about um, uh, an idea to actually address concerns that you have, uh, issues that matter to you, doubts that you have, which you might feel a little hesitant to bring up in a physician's office either because of lack of time or you might simply feel embarrassed to ask them those questions at the time because usually when you're going to meet a doctor, you know, you're hard pressed for time, the physician is hard pressed for time and it is not always the best time to have a detailed conversation. So what I thought is, at least from my experience with my patients, we generally find that there are a lot of these little small things that we as physicians do not really recognize uh, is important to you, but they seem to impact your health in a very significant way and none of these questions uh, or none of these queries are too unimportant uh, to discuss. So we decided uh, in Apollo Excel Care to start a session which is more of a patient education and a patient interaction forum where you can bring up questions that you want to ask uh, you know, a doctor that uh, you have any doubts about or that needs to be addressed that you have not found a satisfactory answer for and we will address it in this forum. So since this is the beginning, this is the first uh, of such of, of a series, I have selected you know, about two, three different topics, uh, things that I have noticed in my own patients and we will address those concerns today. You're welcome to uh, put in your feedback. You are welcome to ask questions on the forum. I'll try to address those you know, at the end uh, of the session. Uh, though I'm speaking in English um, and I'm stationed in Guwahati, the reason I'm speaking in English is because we get patients from all over the Northeast, you know, from the neighboring states. So we are trying to use a language that is accessible to, uh, you know, patients from other states also. However, I am conversant in Ohomia, in Hindi, and in Bangla. Um, I am able to understand and speak these languages. So uh, if you would like to choose a different language to ask a question, or if you'd like me to answer in a different language, please feel free. I can try to do that. And um, Another thing I would like to say is that um, the topics in the future will not really be determined by me. I would like for you all to give your input as to what you would like to discuss and we will determine the sessions um, you know, as you would see fit. So if there are specific concerns that you have or even if there is a particular disease that you would like us to explore in more detail uh, or if there is a particular question or a particular topic that you would like me to address, please give your feedback you know, in, the, in the section below so that we can address those topics in the future because this is not going to be the only session we have. This is only the beginning and we intend to continue to have these sessions so that we can address your questions and queries. So the first thing uh, today I thought we would discuss, uh, this is an interesting uh, question that I have faced. Uh, somewhat more commonly in the last you know two three weeks and I thought that would be a good way to start uh, and um, we are that is the reason why we actually labeled today's session as uh, debunking common medical myths uh, because it seems to be uh, something that a lot of patients uh, uh, either believe or it is something that is preventing them from getting themselves treated and this is specifically in relation to diabetes and in relation to uh, hypertension. So I had, you know, diabetes is, you know, diabetes mellitus I'm referring to where you have increased blood sugar and hypertension is high blood pressure, you know, both of which need to be treated because they have significant long term consequences. So I had patients over the last couple of weeks who, you know, had very high blood pressure and some of them had uncontrolled blood sugars and though they knew they had these conditions, they were not taking their medication. The, they were diagnosed earlier then they came to me when they had some complications related to this disease and I asked them why is it what was preventing them from taking the medicine and they told me that uh, they were worried and they were concerned and a lot of people had told them that once they start taking medicine for their diabetes or their blood pressure they would get addicted to these medicines. 
So their question for me was that if I start taking medicines now, will I get addicted to this medicine? This seems to be a very common misperception among patients, uh, especially uh, people who have these chronic diseases, diseases like high blood pressure or diabetes or cholesterol or thyroid, etc., where you need to take medicines long term. So the perception seems to be that because I've started taking medicines now, I will never be able to stop the medicine and somehow I'm, I'm getting dependent on these medications. Uh, that thought is not entirely wrong, but it is not an addiction. And let me explain why. We Addiction is something where if you start taking a medicine, it might be a drug or it might be anything else. It might be smoking, it might be alcohol, or it might be actually a medicine where over a period of time, your body gets dependent on that particular medicine. And this dependency does not simply extend to the effect of the medicine, but it also extends beyond that. Meaning when I stop that medicine, you are going to have unpleasant withdrawal symptoms. So suppose you are taking a sleeping medicine and you can constantly take this medicine every night to go to sleep and you become dependent on this medicine. When I stop the medicine, you are actually not going to be able to sleep and you might have other symptoms that is going to make you make it unpleasant for you. That is an addiction. There are a lot of pain medications, especially opiate like morphine or tramadol, you know, pain, pain control medications that can also cause dependency. Now, what this dependency means is that when you stop taking the medicine, you're going to have a lot of unpleasant side effects because your body has got habituated to taking this medicine and it is not simply the pain relief but many other things the body has got habituated to. So addiction generally refers to a condition where you take a medicine that has some effect on the brain. When you take it long enough, your body gets physically or psychologically dependent on that medication and when you stop that medication, you start having withdrawal symptoms or you get unpleasant symptoms essentially. So that is what an addiction normally is. When we talk about high blood pressure or diabetes, when you take the medicine, the disease comes under control. Now you probably know that hypertension, that is high blood pressure or diabetes are not diseases that can be cured, barring a few uh, situations where for example, if you have diabetes because you are grossly overweight and if you end up losing the weight, you might be actually able to cure your diabetes or if you're very hypertensive you take a lot of salt and you have changed your diet you have managed to change your lifestyle you're doing regular exercise and your uh, hypertension is not very high the pressure is not very high you might actually be able to reverse the high blood pressure so there are cures in some cases but mostly these uh, diseases like diabetes and hypertension you actually need to continue to take the medicine a lot of times for the rest of your life this is not an addiction. This simply means that you take the medication to control your symptoms. And if you stop taking the medicine, the only effect that that is going to do is that your blood pressure will again come back up or your sugars will simply not be under control. You're not going to have any other unpleasant side effects because you stopped the medication. If you do not, however, choose to take the medicine, suppose you decide that I do not want to take this medicine, Though you are not taking a medicine, your disease is not under control, meaning your blood pressure is still high, your sugars will still be high, and you are going to have to face the consequences of not controlling the disease. Both of these conditions, high blood pressure and diabetes, are generally referred to as silent killers. And the reason they're referred to as silent killers is because there are really no symptoms that you get when you have diabetes or if you have high blood pressure. With high blood pressure, a lot of pa my patients tell me that we get to know when the pressure is high and they usually refer to some discomfort in the back of their neck or a headache or feeling a little giddy, etc. Now these symptoms that you get sometimes when your blood pressure is very high are not always dependable to detect the rise in blood pressure and a lot of times you get symptoms only when your blood pressure is completely out of control. So if you have a blood pressure say of 200 over 110 then you might have symptoms of giddiness or you know you might feel that like something is wrong or you might get a headache. If you have a blood pressure of say 160 or 170 over maybe even 95 or 100, you might have no symptoms at all. However, when you have a blood pressure at that level that is not controlled, 
even though you're functioning completely normally, your body is still having to manage the side effects of the blood pressure. And this is something you will not know immediately, but you're going to find out only after a period of time. So what is going to happen is five years, 10 years down the line, when the blood pressure is not controlled, slowly you'll find that the small blood vessels in your heart, the small blood vessels in the brain or the small blood vessels inside the kidneys will get hard. And you're going to find that the kidney is not working as well as before you are at increased risk of getting a heart attack because the blood vessels have become more narrow. You are at increased risk of getting a stroke because the blood vessels in the brain have become more weak. So these are the consequences of not taking care of the blood pressure on time. Now, it might seem when you're not taking the medicine, you might be able to go and probably get some bragging rights of telling other people that I'm not taking my blood pressure medicine. So without medicine, I'm performing fine. But if the blood pressure is not actually under control, you are still at risk of getting all the consequences of high blood pressure. And again, let me reiterate, just because you take the blood pressure medicine and you need the medicine to control the blood pressure does not mean you're addicted to the medicine. It simply means that the medicine is doing its job. So because you're taking the medicine, the blood pressure is under control and as long as you continue to take the medicine, the blood pressure will stay under control. It is true that both diabetes and high blood pressure are progressive diseases, meaning specifically in the case of uh, diabetes. They are progressive diseases, meaning over a period of time, the disease progresses gradually. So the amount of medicine that you start with may not be always the amount of medicine you will continue to take for the rest of your life. As the disease progresses, you might have to take more medicine or a combination of medicines to keep the disease under control. Even those medicines generally, obviously you're going to go to a physician, you know, for the, for the advice for that. So as you continue to take these medicines, if you are able to keep the blood pressure and the diabetes within the recommended numbers, you know, the recommended guidelines as to what the control should be, we can significantly reduce the complications associated with both diabetes and high blood pressure. So when a physician recommends that you should start taking medicine for, and there are very clear guidelines as to when you need to start taking medicine for blood pressure and diabetes. So when a physician recommends that you need to take medicine for it, please do not be skeptical that, or you can even take a second opinion if you feel that, you know, I don't want to take medicines right now. So you can go and ask, talk to another physician to find out if you really need to start medicine or not. But please do not feel that if I start taking this medicine now, somehow I'm going to get addicted to the medicine and that is the reason I will not be able to stop it ever. It is not because you have got addicted to the medicine, but it is simply because the disease itself is a chronic condition and taking the medicine is necessary to keep it under control and to reduce the risk of long-term complications of the disease. So that is the number one thing I thought I would try to address because this is something that I hear very often when I, especially in patients who are newly diagnosed with diabetes and newly diagnosed with uh, uh, high blood pressure. As far as diabetes is concerned, I would like to however point out that there has been a huge increase in the incidence of diabetes, especially among younger people. Earlier, this used to be a disease of slightly older people, more than 50 years of age at least. Nowadays, we find a lot of diabetes in young people, even in the 20s and 30s, and a lot of it has to do with her lifestyle. It is because of, you know, our generally we have started um, eating a lot of processed food. We uh, do not do regular exercise. We are probably putting on weight as a population. We are putting on weight and the same trends we had seen in China initially when China had become economically, you know, more well off. And once people start earning more money or they have more disposable income, we end up adopting a very Western diet. You know, we like to eat a lot of processed food, a lot of fast food. We probably drink a lot of uh, sodas, you know, Coke, etc. And all of these contribute to the development and to the progression of diabetes. So it is very important, especially for the younger population, to adopt a very healthy lifestyle. By healthy lifestyle, I don't mean you need to go to a gym and become a, you know, a, a bodybuilder. That's not the kind of uh, you know, um, exercise I'm recommending. What I'm saying is that you need to be healthy enough where you need to watch your weight, 
not become overweight, not become obese and follow a regular um, exercise schedule so that you can continue to control your sugar and your, and your um, blood pressure. And especially with diabetes, we have noticed that if a person can lose about 10% of their body weight, if they are overweight, if they can lose about 10% of the body weight, there is a significant reduction on the amount of medication they need to take and there is an improvement in the blood sugars you know, of these patients. So lifestyle modification both for diabetes and hypertension are vitally important and we need to remember that. So along with the medication, though I am saying that medications are important to take, the lifestyle modification goes hand in hand and you need to focus on that also. So this is the first issue that I wanted to talk about. Issue number two, another very common thing that uh, you know I have noticed is you have probably either you yourself or you might know people who have thyroid problems. So thyroid problems, specifically hypothyroidism, is something very commonly uh, that is diagnosed nowadays. And a lot of these people take thyroid medication. And their question always to me is, you know, I had these abnormal numbers, you know, I was hypothyroid, my thyroid is not working properly, I was started on this medication, how long do I need to continue this medicine? Do, now do I have to take thyroid medication for the rest of my life? And I think here probably it's a, uh, you know, it's somewhat uh, the, the physician's fault also that we don't always clearly explain to the patient what to expect of their hypothyroidism. So the first thing I would like to say is that the vast majority of people who are diagnosed with hypothyroidism, meaning thyroids not functioning properly, have what is called subclinical hypothyroidism. What is subclinical hypothyroidism? As the name itself suggests, you don't really have any symptoms related to the thyroid. But just because thyroid is the thyroid test is one of those tests that, are, that, that is done routinely, we found abnormal numbers. And usually these numbers, the TSH level, you're probably quite familiar with the TSH level. That is how we diagnose hypothyroidism. So most of the time, this TSH level is a little above the upper range. So it will be about, say, 7 or 8 or 6.5. And most labs have an upper limit of about 4, 4.5. So the moment they see this number, which is a little higher than 4.5, the immediate you know, conclusion is this patient is hypothyroid and the patient needs to be on thyroid medication. This is not true. So all those people who have been taking thyroid medication for subclinical hypothyroidism, where you have not had any symptoms and you just had a number that was slightly above normal, probably do not need to be on thyroid medication. So the way we decide who needs to be on thyroid medicine is that if you have subclinical hypothyroidism, the first thing we find out is, is it truly subclinical, meaning do you have any symptoms? So if you have a lot of fatigue, if you have constipation, if you are depressed, so anything that lowers your metabolic rate, if you have symptoms related to that, you might be symptomatic. I say might because I'll explain in a couple of minutes why I said might. Along with that, what we check is another test called the anti-TPO antibody, which is a thyroid antibody. Because hypothyroidism generally when it needs to be treated is an autoimmune condition. So the body's immune system is attacking the thyroid gland and it is slowly destroying the thyroid gland. So if your immune antibodies are high, it is very likely that you have hypothyroidism that will need treatment, if not now, at least in the future meaning the hypothyroidism will progressively increase over a period of time. If your antibodies are negative and if your TSH is just in this borderline below 10, it is unlikely that it is going to keep advancing in the future unless you are at risk. So if you have diabetes, if you have any other autoimmune condition, then there is a possibility that your condition might actually progress. So all you need to do is if you are not symptomatic, to simply follow the TSH once a year and make sure that it has not gone above 10. All people with a TSH below 10 who do not have symptoms don't need to be on thyroid medication. If you are already taking medicine for this condition, then please talk to your physician and see whether you really need to take it or not. But you don't need, most of these patients don't need to be on thyroid medication for the rest of their life. The second thing is that if you actually have an autoimmune disease or if your TSH is progressively increasing over a period of time, then you do need to be on medication and you probably need to be on it for the rest of your life. Thirdly, for those people who have slightly elevated TSH and if you have some symptoms like 
I said constipation, fatigue, tiredness, etc. And then when we give you the treatment for it, so you take thyroid pills, these symptoms need to reverse. If the symptoms do not reverse, you cannot attribute it to thyroid. So I find a lot of patients will come and tell me, my knee hurts because I have thyroid. My ankle hurts because I have thyroid. I'm losing my hair because I have thyroid. I feel tired because I have thyroid. And then when I check their numbers, I find that the TSH is somewhere around 6, 6.5. And none of these are happening because of their thyroid. But thyroid is the most, it's kind of, you know, the, uh, the dummy that we use. to It's a scapegoat. We blame everything on the thyroid because, you know, that's what we have heard. We have either read it in a book or somebody has told us that it's happening because of thyroid. People even, you know, blame their arthritis on their thyroid. So thyroid is not the reason why you're having all these symptoms. At least most of the time it is not. So it is time to stop blaming the thyroid to really reevaluate to see if you need to continue on the thyroid medication or not. And it's very easy to figure that out. And uh, so you'll have to talk to a physician about it. Please don't stop taking the thyroid medication yourself alone. Don't make a decision by yourself. Please go and consult with your physician and ask this question. Do I need to be on this medicine or not? And if I do, do I need to be on it for the rest of my life? These are questions you can ask, uh, you know, him or her. So that is another thing. And uh, this is something I think all those people who take regular thyroid medication need to know that there is a small fraction that needs to continue this medicine for the rest of their lives. Most people don't need to take it all the time. We are particularly um, strict about using thyroid medicine in those people who are trying to get pregnant or who are already pregnant. So this number of 10 that I just said applies to those people of, or to those females who are not pregnant. So during pregnancy, if you're either trying to conceive or if you're already pregnant, we try to keep the TSH at the actual range that is given from the lab. So it should be below, we try to keep it around three actually, three or you know between one and three, because it improves the chances of, it makes you more fertile and it improves, this, uh, improves the chances of conception. So there are a few exceptions to what I just said. And you know, if you go and discuss uh, this issue with your physician, you will find out you know, what, how, how uh, to go about it. Um, another question that related to thyroid that a lot of people ask me is that what can I not eat now that I have hypothyroidism and you know there are all there's an entire list of uh, vegetables and other food products that they come up with uh, that they tell me that you know um, this my friend has hypothyroidism and he has told me that I cannot take all these medication all these different foods so let me again reiterate that the evidence that foods are going to make your thyroid worse is actually very limited the things that generally increase the, your problems with thyroid are those foods, there are certain vegetables that contain within them a, a chemical that blocks the uptake of iodine by the thyroid. So these are generally things like cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, etc. A lot of people confuse the, the food restrictions for uric acid which is a high protein diet. We have advised people not to take a high protein diet. They generally confuse this high protein foods with the thyroid foods and to stop taking all these different things. So you ought not to do that. And the foods that are restricted for thyroid. Now, if you take say cabbage once a week, that is not going to affect your thyroid. So you don't need to banish cabbage from your diet. Neither do you need to banish broccoli from your diet. Only if you're, if you're taking these, med, uh, these foods very often, so twice, you know, three, four times a week if you're eating it, or if you're eating large quantities of it, only then is it going to be significant enough to prevent the absorption of iodine from your, uh, from your gut into your thyroid. So taking it once a week, taking it once in two weeks, which is what most of us do, and none of these banned vegetables are taken very often. So taking it once in a while is not going to do anything to your thyroid. So please stop, uh, you know, fearing uh, that um, taking it once is going to somehow make my thyroid condition worse. It is not going to do that. Yes, there are, you know, published papers that tell us that these are foods you should try to avoid, but that avoidance should be within reasonable, you know, within reason. It should not be that you completely eliminate it from your diet or by mistake, if you take it at one particular time, somehow that is going to, you know, extremely negatively impact your thyroid health. That is not true at all. Um, these are the two, uh, these are the two primary um, topics that I had thought about. And uh, uh, the other thing I wanted to say was that there was another question about fatty liver. 
and um, so a lot of people ask me uh, regarding fatty liver and they tell me that you know I got an ultrasound done and um, you know my dog my the, uh, the sonologist the radiologist told me that I have fatty liver now you know I'm very worried that you know something is going to happen to my liver now what should I do about it so this is actually a very big topic so we are going to address it I think we will dedicate one session to discussion of fatty liver and fatty liver disease but for now let me just tell you that the the fatty liver that is diagnosed when you get an ultrasound done is something that the radiologist sees with the eyes meaning they can see a slightly different color of the liver when they do the sonogram when they do the ultrasound and that indicates that there might be an increased amount of fat inside the liver that does not mean that this fat is adversely affecting your liver so generally there are two names that we generally use one is called steatosis steatosis means accumulation of fat inside the liver cells and another one is called steatohepatitis which basically means accumulation of fat and following that inflammation of the liver so this hepatitis part is what actually causes the liver damage the steatohepatitis the steatosis is simply the accumulation of fat simple accumulation of fat inside the liver is not going to adversely impact your health at least as of now so yes it does mean that you need to improve your lifestyle you need to lose weight you need to eat um, uh, you know uh, more carefully you need to reduce the amount of fat in your diet you need to get some regular exercise and lose some weight so it means all of those things but it is not yet in this in the in the condition where you actually the liver has started getting damaged so generally when we find somebody with fatty liver uh, in an ultrasound we do a test called LFT which is liver function test and you've probably heard the names SGOT, SGPT which are liver enzymes or ALT, AST the same liver enzymes and these enzyme elevations indicate that there is a slow burning or a slow process of damage happening inside the liver so if the enzymes are high that means that the uh, the fat in the liver cells is actually causing some damage that needs treatment and that treatment involves medications and it also involves uh, you know lifestyle modification however if the ALT AST or the SGOT SGPT are actually in the normal range you probably do not have ongoing liver damage so while it is a warning that you need to change your lifestyle you are not having active damage to the liver so there, these two things are quite different. So please don't panic when, when you get an ultrasound done. If they tell you most people get some degree of you know, fatty liver disease diagnosed during an ultrasound. Most of them will have grade 1 or grade 2 fatty liver. That's what you know, an ultrasound usually says. Unless you're really lean and you know, in which case you probably do not have any fat in the liver. So just the ultrasound telling you that there is fatty liver is not a death sentence it does not mean that your liver is going to be completely damaged now and you need to panic about it but you do need to go in and see a physician get the liver function test done so you know if there is actually any any ongoing damage to the liver cells and if anything needs to be done about it if you need to be on any medication for it okay so that's basically you know about fatty liver but fatty liver involves a number of other issues that we will dedicate an entire session to and uh, and we will go from there and we will you know talk about uh, what else needs to be done uh, you know to deal with fatty liver because it is actually a serious condition it was not uh, you know it wasn't in focus till a few years back when we actually had measuring tools as to uh, the, the damage caused, caused by fatty liver uh, you know how we can actually diagnose that so now we have those measuring tools fatty liver is something that you should not take lightly but at the same time you should not panic when you hear uh, during an ultrasound if somebody says that you have fatty liver but it, it is a reason to go in and see your physician to have a discussion to find out exactly what the condition is and where you are and what you can do about it proactively to reduce the risk of developing you know hepatitis related to the fatty liver so these are basically the you know three um, uh, you know basic things that you know we wanted to address today um, uh, in this discussion and we will have more um, such discussions in the future do we have uh, you know any questions related to that no so um, any uh, you know uh, questions related to this you can put it in a message board and uh, you know we are going to follow up from there uh, as to you know what you would like to talk about or, or what you would like to 
um, discuss in the future and we will have more sessions like this where uh, we will address qu questions, queries, concerns, doubts that you might have about your own health or about very specific questions if you have related to healthcare, uh, we will be happy to address them uh, on this forum. So thanks a lot, thanks for the patient listening and uh, we, will, we hope to have more sessions like this in the future. Thank you.